so I've been talking about this week doing a video, kind of talking about my thoughts on just how doomed the world is. Uh, so you guys remember Holly, my girlfriend, uh, mainly from the video where we <laughs> we collabed to respond to Hassan responding to my criticism of him, and now me and Hassan are besties. Um, but yeah, Holly interviewed, interviewed me for that, and I thought what would be good for this video is because what I wanted in this video is to me is for me to articulate how I'm feeling right now, um, which I think will reflect how a lot of you are feeling right now because of right now what's happening, like an actual invasion of Gaza by Israeli ground forces, apparently. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be like a full-scale one or just like a, you know, one of these raids they do, but it seems to be bigger than anything in the last like decade. Um, but what I was kind of talking about yesterday is just my perspective of the whole world and how it keeps getting worse. And I guess the meme about the trolley you can only watch seems to be very relevant right now. Um, so what Holly is going to serve as is basically in some ways you, the audience, because Holly is very political herself, but unlike either a lot of you guys who are constantly watching Twitch streams that are political or myself who has to cover this, she, you know, she's not having to talk about this all the time. So Holly has to go about her daily life doing a normal job while consuming this stuff. Whereas me, this like literally is my job. So, you know, it's kind of something I can't ever stop thinking about. But that's why I think Holly's perspective is good because um, she is like the rest of you, I guess, in terms of she doesn't work in politics or political coverage, but still has to consume this stuff. So on that note, um, we'll start We'll start with you and then I'll say how I'm feeling. So how are you broadly feeling about the world, but mainly spurred on by what's happening right now in Palestine? Yeah, I think the last couple of weeks have been really hard for both of us. Um, and it's just been really like distracting constantly, um, yeah. really hard to go about like your daily life and stuff like I think we both felt very affected by it probably like two weeks ago and then we were just saying this week felt a little bit better like I've been to the Palestine protest for the last two weeks and it's kind of like comforting in a way to like feel less isolated in your views yeah. and stuff um and then yeah kind of felt like it was getting a bit better this week and then uh I was just working this evening and um just checking Twitter and seeing that Apparently all communication's been cut off, like Gaza's been like plunged into darkness and it's just, I think we're at an age now where you can really contemplate the reality of the horrors. Like we yeah. grew up obviously seeing war on our television, but I don't, like you, I know you have spoken in the past about having a different uh, relationship with the news and stuff growing up, but I definitely did not feel as like connected on a human level to what was happening yeah. as I am now. We're older, so it makes more sense. I understand it more. I feel very strongly about Palestine and stuff. So yeah, it's just really hard. Like this evening I was uh, just writing up a new story about Dua Lipa and it, I was just like, this feels so <laughs> like yeah. so insignificant right now compared to what I'm seeing on my Twitter feed. So yeah, it's been depressing a few weeks. Yeah. Um, you feel the same, right? Yeah, and you just feel guilty for having the like. We went for a nice walk today, and I took a I took a few photos. I was gonna put my Instagram story. I might still do that at some point, but it's like now I kind of don't want to because it is so terrible. Oh, by the way, people, if I seem distracted, I'm just making sure everything is running properly. But um, yeah, so I was just feeling kind of bad for having a normal life, and that that's the problem really is because you're way more busy than I am. But by and large, you'd say we have like a pretty like good life. Um, I, like I don't hate like being alive, for example. And the thing is, if I lived in like some sort of matrix simulation where like this stuff didn't happen externally, like all this terrible stuff in the news, I'd probably be pretty happy. Um, I mean, I don't know how my like, YouTube career exists in this matrix world, but like, yeah, like it's just the external stuff. But that's the problem with having empathy because you were talking about the news and what the news conditioned people to do, because this is before social media, was see Muslims as subhuman or see Muslims as like, or well, the Middle East is a place that has no peace. Yeah. So people always kill each other. Yeah. Um, and then I talked about in my video, I think it was last week, about the invasion of Lebanon in 2006 by Israel. I don't know what's going on, but even as a kid, I don't know what's going on, but I doubt my lack of understanding was that much less than most people in our country. Yeah. 
even though even though I was like an 11 year old or something yeah and I think like I said with the creator we're just so used to seeing images of this stuff yeah um where if you don't have empathy and you don't understand these things maybe you can distance yourself from it thinking oh it's just you know Hamas versus IDF Hamas, I saw that in Yahoo today tweet Hamas ISIS as one thing because mm. he knows how Westerners view this stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it's their proper propaganda. Yeah. So that's depressing because so many people fall for it. Although I will say the polling does show that at least most people in Britain support a ceasefire. Yeah. I honestly don't think most people in Britain even give a shit about the Middle East, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like, I feel like you're raised to understand things in such a binary way and yeah. you're raised to think, to uh, like understand things through the lens of good versus bad not mm. like and if and if things are complicated it's oh this is so complicated i'm not no, educated was... enough to comment on it like that has been yeah. the most annoying thing and that, that's that, what that's one well. of the things that fresh was really hard for us a couple of weeks ago was seeing all the celebrities weigh in and like you're posting a statement to your millions of followers saying i'm not that educated on this subject and it's yeah. like well why on earth are you weighing in on something so important but also the people yeah. who did weigh in would like sharing the most harmful like basically propaganda yeah, like amy schumer is probably the worst example just yeah. really really racist and i white think woman. like in our personal lives and in our work lives and stuff we've always really struggled with like feeling out of control and that felt like a very uh like specific it was like a within the the wider context of everything happening yeah. that felt like a really specific trigger for us in like in that feeling yeah. out of control it's like all th these people that have a platform these people that have power or like power um, influence are doing this thing that is so harmful to like mm. the cause and you're just there powerless and it's like i don't know it was the silence it, like i yeah. we we went we we, like, we saw like a turning point like maybe last week when I said people that never, ever, yeah. ever I yeah. would have expected to have posted about Palestine. Just people who don't really share Random, political random people we go to school Yeah, on so. their story. Yeah. And they started sharing. I was like, oh my God, maybe the, like, the tide is turning. Mm. But before that, it was just like, the people that are going to be influenced by this stuff are the people that don't know anything necessarily. And of course I understand it's it's confusing and it's this and it's that. But like, at its very core, like it's it's not like this confusing historical thing mm. about religion blah blah, blah. like yeah. it's just so unjust on like a fundamental like basic level of like people are literally getting kicked out of their homes yeah um well but... I, I think what you're saying is a lot of people like to dismiss it as oh it's complicated it's like a very old conflict between yeah. religions is a way to not engage with the actual arguments because it's not about religion mm -hmm. the thing is it's not even for palestinians it's not even about religion for a lot of israelis it is about religion yeah. which is not how it's framed in our culture it's framed as one side is very motivated by religion one side and not yeah that's how we're told it is but it's actually the opposite where which might might, might not even make sense to people because one group are like fundamentalists but at the same time Netanyahu's power comes from the Orthodox community at the moment. That's how he got back in. So he's doing this to appease them, and they don't even serve in the military, so they don't like have the you know the sacrifices of that. But um, also, I used to say to you, um, not because like I thought you didn't know about, it, but I used to say to you like you don't even have to understand it because you're not a diplomat at the UN yeah. trying to work out a historical solution for this. Like that's yeah. not what your average person is there for. Because you know I I know about this topic. I'd say more than most people because you know i've had the you know privilege of studying it at university i've read books on it i know about the context historical or geopolitical so i'm very informed in it but that's why i say to people yes it is very complicated like everything in that region is very complicated like colonialism historical like relationships between different communities but at the same time it's not complicated to see that even if you think both sides are just as bad as each other, one side is disproportionately hurt and the other side way more. Yeah. And that's very easy for anyone to see that most people are civilians. And if you just learn about Gaza a tiny bit, you know in any any other context, if it was white people, you'd support them. Like we've we've been saying, if that's Belfast in the 1990s and the British government are doing that yeah. to like the Catholic part of Belfast, everyone's up, outraged. Yeah, but the yeah. problem is, because the Catholics in Belfast had the support of the United States there was pressure to end that yeah. because they didn't want, because well, so much Americans come from Ireland in the first place. We said, imagine if like the Guildford pub bombing, which was like a famous bombing during the troubles um, yeah, was... in the UK. Imagine if that happened and then the retaliation was that you just go and bomb the mm. whole of Belfast. It's just like the, yeah. it, it's just not 
like viewed yeah. in the same way. And, and of course, the British army often did do collective punishment to yeah. communities, but like obviously never the same scale as what we're talking about here. Um, and yeah, just the the powerlessness is a good thing. And the, the worst thing about being a leftist, and this is one of my more popular tweets, I said, the worst thing about being a leftist is you know everything bad that's going to happen and you just get to watch. Yeah. So I even tweeted, the first day this started, I said, they're going to use it as an excuse to just do whatever they want now. Mm-hmm. And I, I, and maybe that seems obvious to people, but I don't think it's completely obvious the way the media were framing it. Like, it's just like a very specific strike against an insurgent group. It's like, no, they're just going to, they're going to flatten the whole yeah. territory. Like, yeah. I knew that straight away. And that's why I was like, oh, you know, here we go. Yeah. And yeah, it's just, it's hard to watch because now we have social media and every time something like this happens, like be it Russia, Ukraine, but then even with that, you see less of this because they have protection, either their military or bomb shelters, everything yeah. like that. Where Palestinians don't really have that mm-hmm. um, in, in in Gaza, so it's just yeah, really... it like they were all, the situation was already so dire, yeah. and then it's like dire to just like unimaginable. But, but the problem is being a leftist in these like times is you know everyone is like like media is lying to you, media doesn't understand. Yeah. Um, the way they describe the conflict is lying to you. It's just so irresponsible. Yeah, yeah. and and you understand how that like allows this thing to even happen in the first place because they create the conditions where everyone can either be apathetic and think it's just like a natural thing that happens or like it's inevitable which in some ways you know i'm going to talk about a bit later but in terms of like they think they shouldn't say anything Mm -hmm. and also the hilarious thing is is i've gone on other channels i've made videos about this the weaponization of anti-semitism charges has backed the Labour Party into such a corner, they can't even call out what's going on right now because yeah. they're so terrified of yeah. being called anti-Semites and losing the election. Yeah. Because they did that to Jeremy Corbyn, yeah. the Labour right and the Tory party. Yeah. And because they went along with that, now they're terrified of, if I literally just say, violence and death is bad, like our, our lovely Labour leader yeah, literally yeah. endorsed what the Israelis are doing. So it's like, that. that's where we find ourselves in the UK where... Like in the US, what is my choices in an election? Yeah. Labour or Tory, Democrat or GOP. On this issue, they are literally the same. And in our country, Labour and the Tories are the same on every issue, pretty yeah. much. So it's like, as a person who understands why this even happens in the first place, a lot of it just comes back to capitalism, um, you just feel so out of control mm-hmm. and powerless. And one thing I want to say in the comments, please don't put comments like, oh, doomerism is cringe, because like... Sometimes you just have to vent. And then, I don't know if we want to just move on a bit about our general feelings towards the world now, but... um, Well, just before we do move on, I just wanted to say as well that um, living in a country where you just have lost all faith in your government, like, if there ever was Mm. any faith anyway, but it's like, yeah, like, having an opposition leader that is so spineless, that is literally saying, yes, we support Israel's right to defend itself, while you you continue to watch, like, what it's doing, like, literally committing genocide in real time, and it's just kind of like, because obviously we've lived in other countries, and we're, like, talking about, like, where to live in the future and everything, it's like, I like England, but our government continually makes life worse for us yeah. in every possible way and like on a global in the global context yeah. doesn't stand up for like what's right doesn't condemn genocide like is on the side of all of the bad people and it's just like well what like i i just can't see myself living in a country that continues to do that yeah. like and the thing the thing is there's nothing redeeming about our government, because I, I was watching... It, do- it doesn't care about us. So I was watching a TikTok of someone who grew up in China and I think they immigrated to Australia and they've gone back to China and they're talking about how different it is yeah. and how developed it is. And they're yeah. saying like this, they got on this train they're like, when I was a kid, this train was so old yeah. and I was looking at the train, it looked like the bullet train in, in, right, to- in Tokyo. Yeah. And I'm like, obviously for all the problems governments around the world have, including China it's obviously at least you might have something good like with a developing country as well where things are getting better by every metric, be yeah, that yeah. like China or Vietnam. At least your government, as bad as they can be on certain things, at least they're saying we're going to do something and they actually make like tangible steps to do that. Yeah. Well, our government is actually like, we will not make your life better, actually we'll make it worse and everything we do is in service to making your life worse yeah. to make our donors or ourselves richer. Yeah. And that's why like... Sometimes in certain countries, like China, for example, like you do have that dynamic of elites rich enriching themselves. But then at least there is tangible, like, oh, 
look how much they've developed like eastern china's railway networks isn't that nice where our railway networks like fall apart it's and it's just it's just terrible yeah. so it's like we're at the declining stage so i'm a little jealous uh, of other countries that might have some optimism for the future despite obviously massive problems with their own governments and everything and that's why like growing up in the uk and the us is like neoliberalism central of course they are it is neoliberalism central the uk margaret thatcher and ronald reagan in the in the us and it's just like this individualist capitalism which brainwashes so many people and then we try and import the us culture war about trans people yeah, yeah. about all this stuff and i also was frustrated from like an irish background as well um the exact same stuff that i use against palestinians have always been used against the irish as well yeah and i've always said it does not matter what insurgent group is fighting the israelis they will be demonized in the exact same way it doesn't it doesn't if they were all communists who didn't harm civilians everyone would say the exact same stuff yeah. no, no one would care mm -hmm. because that's that's the playbook of slowly oppressing a people for centuries and decades is okay because the violence is often very controlled and then you get like you get outbursts like we're seeing right now where it is all terrible but then it's like it'll go back to normal like the status quo for a bit yeah. and it happened in Ireland as well where people be like oh how could this violent insurgent group like the IRA how could they do this yeah. and it's like oh my god like how and that's because they would do this like violence which obviously is terrible but people would never understand the context behind that violence so yeah, it just yeah. looked so in the UK Jeremy Corbyn is called like terrorist sympathizer and he helped peace he didn't even back them. He helped the peace process. And it's like, you see that. And that's that's where it comes in a tiny bit of, I think, and what was frustrating about going to the protests, if we're going to move on a bit to that, is the lack of responsibility white people feel for the actions of their own government. Yeah. And why does it always have to be left to people who have maybe either suffered some sort of oppression at the hands of society or come from that background like you know you come from indian and irish background i come from just an irish background and sometimes as a white person it is hard to get in touch with the struggle of growing up a you know a different ethnicity or background and you told me like you know you discovered more about your granddad and your mum as you were growing up and then that's how you can relate more to just the power structure of i guess you know white supremacy which is fundamentally underpinning a lot of what's happening with the uk us and israel right yeah. now is this maintaining white supremacy mm -hmm. where Irish people didn't used to fit into that. Um, Indian people, you know, have a weird relationship with that. Obviously, yeah. historically don't fit in with that, but can be, as we've seen with like Modi right now in India, they can be complicit in upholding this as well. Um, so in that sense, it's like frustrating that you have to come from a background that understands that sort of colonial oppression mm -hmm. or racism to actually go out and protest. And I'm not saying this is tr uni a universal truth, but it is interesting when you go to these protests that... It's, and I know it's a very personal issue to a lot of Muslims, but it's just frustrating in that often marginalized groups are leading this. And it happens in the US as well with African-Americans yeah, yeah. um, often leading these protest movements as well. And it's just frustrating that, like, and, you, and you'll see it with your own social media bubble. For me personally, like, no one posting about this. Yeah, no yeah. one. I, like, most of my friends, yeah, most of my friends are, are white. Um, English, Irish, or like Welsh or something. Like, they're not posting about it, right? But then we have friends, I have friends who are Muslims, and they're always posting about it. Yeah. And I have friends from like other marginalized backgrounds and even like people I follow who are Jewish on different platforms, they're posting about yeah. it um, in support of Palestine. So it's like very frustrating that why is it left to these groups and not the groups that have always experienced privilege who are not outraged by this as much mm -hmm. or don't really care about it, I guess, yeah. is, is why I get a bit frustrated because I'm so, I'm quite removed from my Irish background more so than you are removed from your backgrounds because my grandparents where you, you have, a, you know, mum who's half Indian, you have a dad who's an Irish immigrant and stuff. So it, I get it can be hard sometimes, but you, you just have to recognise like, that it wasn't long ago that people like us were treated how certain people treat it today. Yeah, you, get... you say that though, but like I've never really thought about that as like a reason for what's motivating me to like want to go and protest and stuff right now. Like I'm I, saying the empathy. Yeah, is, yeah, is and I, I don't know, if to talk about on like a more selfish level, I think it's like we've both always really had a problem with like um authority <laughs> and it's like when you've experienced like um just even like a bad boss or like injustice on a small scale can be so radicalizing yeah. so i'm not saying that like oh i've, I've had a bad boss and that's made me like want to go and like protest but well, like you should read I the think, comments from yesterday's video it's yeah kind of like that. well yeah i think it's like your own experience within your bubble of being a victim of like capitalism or whatever yeah. and then you just 
it's like a domino thing where you gradually become more and more angry about things and yeah. it's like you have to have some sense of like what it feels like to be powerless even if it's it's so insignificant in comparison yeah. to to be like no like that's actually really not okay and then it's like well imagine what it would be like where that's your entire life where like you don't even your home isn't even protected like yeah. you can't even go out and live your life can't even go out and play on the streets and stuff yeah. like so uh, yeah I, I i agree with what you're saying but, but i, I yeah, think it's but also just like growing like becoming an adult yeah. in a capitalist society well, I mean, as well fundamentally everything going on is about capitalism in yeah. terms of while some of the motivations for the colonialism might not be capitalist in nature israel's place in the world as like an arms manufacturer or like quite a developed economy ensures that um, you know, and in terms of keeping the capitalist status quo Western backed, it's very useful to the Western countries. And that's part of the reason. So yeah, we're all victims of capitalism. So we can relate in some ways to our own oppression. Yeah. It's just made worse if you're from like a marginalized background in your certain country. Yeah. And I think just kind of learning to empathize with that struggle, which a lot of Irish people and Italian people in America definitely forget that they used to be treated as non-whites as well, yeah. essentially. And it's only through assimilation that they've reached the halls of power where Joe Biden is Irish, right? And he, he's enabling this. He should know better. Um, if he, uh, but he's, you know, he's a plastic, isn't he? So yeah, it's I was like, say, it, he's, just, he's just like, yeah. he, he likes to say it just to I say mean, it. Yeah, like, I mean, he likes to, he likes to say it because it's funny. Like yeah. he, he really does not understand like the history of Ireland and stuff. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so like, moving on to that a little bit, um, I want to talk about like general powerlessness in capitalism, which we kind of mentioned, because I just want to talk about this episode of Mr. Robot I've been thinking about, and I tweeted about this today. And um, we were at the protest last week. It was massive. Basically shut down London. And I was thinking, what could I What could I do with all these people if I was like some sort of... I don't even know what to call it. If I was some like revolutionary leader, what could I do with 300,000 people? And I spoke to you and we were there because I was talking about the Egyptian revolution. And I was like, what they did, and I was like, the Trafalgar Square, yeah. I'm thinking about the, the square in Egypt, I'm like, get all those people there, shut down London. And it's like, um, but then I think about why that couldn't happen. And it couldn't happen, because mm -hmm. it happened in Egypt, because for similar reasons, young people desperate, poor people very desperate, they had nothing to lose. And also they had a military that were all conscripts, basically, and they're on their neutral, so they didn't you know, attack the protesters. And it was the government who was the focus. And I was thinking, what like like I said, we couldn't do this because we're all here for Palestine, which unites so many of us. But it's so much harder to unite against capitalism. And yeah. the Egyptian revolution, along with a couple others in the Arab Spring, the only successful anti-capitalist revolutions of our time, which actually inspired the show I'm going to talk about, Mr. Robot. But then even that didn't go to plan. And it literally goes back to square one, where a military dictatorship turns into a democracy. It's not what everyone wants because the Muslim Brotherhood rule the country then it turns back into a military dictatorship, it's back to square one. And you see that even with this great mass movement that literally overthrew a military dictatorship, essentially, then nothing really came of it. And that's what the show Mr. Robot is about in terms of revolution. And what I want to talk about it is there's one episode, very early on, I'm going to keep it vague. But I've been thinking about it a lot lately for some reason. And it's like um, the main character, Elliot, has a girlfriend uh, who was a drug dealer. And he snitches basically to the FBI about this guy because he's very, uh, what's the word? He just posts it all over social media. It's very easy to find him guilty. And then um, he realizes Elliot has a skill as a hacker and he kidnaps the girlfriend um, and says, you'll get her back if you help me escape from prison. And Mr. Robot, this other character, comes in and says to him, don't even bother doing this because she's dead. Um, like there's any any like it's like a mathematical certainty she's not going to survive this but Elliot being good natured and being very driven he does not accept that advice then it turns out he frees this guy from prison and the girlfriend was killed straight away um so Mr. Robot the character was right there was no hope and that's what I feel like in myself is the constant struggle in this system is I fundamentally know like there's a Mr. Robot who is me <laughs> who's telling me there is no hope. And things sometimes things come together where it can't be stopped. And that's Gaza right now. Like that nothing can stop that. It's just it's just a certainty at this point. And as as much as you know you see Palestine action shutting down those weapons factories, massive protests, and it's probably going to be even bigger tomorrow, at the same time, you can't do anything about it. 
and and I know people don't like to hear that and maybe you don't believe it, but then it's like, there's so many of us, why can't we change this? And we can't change it because of various reasons, but you probably have to completely overthrow the existing world order. Mm. But then we're so divided against each other, even over an issue like this, where you have Zionist versus pro-Palestinian activists, because we're not on the side of humanity, because yeah. we're so divided to think in certain ways. We can't realize that, yes, these Palestinians are victims um, of this capitalist system, and also Israelis are victims of their own government and participating in this brutal system because the violence just comes back on them. Yeah. And it's like, we can't get past that. So sometimes it's like, these Gazans are like like a sacrificial lamb to capitalism and all these people don't say anything because because of, at the end of the day, it all traces back to capitalism. So as much as I'm not going to stop like speaking against it, trying to educate people, I fundamentally know it's it's worthless because nothing's going to change. And then in the background, you know, you know, we had COVID, which I think showed people's worst impulses in government, like, our government and the and the Trump government, they saw it as a chance to loot the country, making fake PPE companies to get billions. And then Rishi Sunak comes in, who was the Chancellor at the time, he writes off like five billion in debt these companies owed them. So yeah. they just got five billion handout. They use the pandemic where <laughs> like how many hundred thousands how many was it like a couple hundred thousand as well? I am so desensitized to it. But it was a massive amount of people died. And Especially that, in the US, that it was just like, well, we'll just let them keep dying. So yeah, we're not even going to make, then, like in Florida and stuff, not even going to put the restrictions in. Yeah, and then it's like just seeing that and just feeling like, how, how do you even fight against that? And like we're saying with our own options in the UK, what we choose one or two parties that are exactly the same. Mm. They weaponize like this woke sentiment, the, Lib the Labour Party, so they're too scared to even speak out against Israel right now. And it's like in my head, when we have climate change coming in the background, we're already seeing it. We have these refugees crises already and the way they're reacting to it is terrible. And there's such an easy solution. The solution would be let them in, create new towns for people. There's so much space, even in, in this country, it's a small country with a high population, but we have so much space here. If we thought about things differently, we could actually accommodate these things and hopefully help mitigate climate change. But that's not the way, the way the world works. And even now, as I was thinking about this, I wrote a tweet, but I didn't send it. It was about how other countries don't even have an option now. It's just capitalism. Yeah. Before you had um, the Eastern Bloc and you had the capitalist bloc, but now you don't even have that choice because even if you choose like China or whatever, excuse me, it's still buying into the same system. So in my head, it's just like very, very hopeless because we all know this isn't sustainable. Like not we all know, but I think a lot of people understand that something's wrong with this system and it doesn't matter what political background you're from. You're seeing it a lot. Like I've documented this a lot. Fascists are talking about like, going back to tradition and rural societies, right? And there's something in that, that everyone is disillusioned with corporate capitalism, but people just don't know how to articulate it or they don't have the understanding. And that was in the TikTok yesterday, which you saw as well. She, all she's talking about is the commute. And, yeah. and But what she's really talking about is work stripping your identity. Yeah. And that's something, so, like if you read the comments on my video, go read it, people watching this right now. So many people, like literally 99% of people are all sharing similar stories. So we all know. Mm -hmm. But, but what can we do about it when we're so divided about other things? And I'm not trying to be a class reductionist saying, oh, don't talk about transgender rights because that will make this racist, bigoted truck driver not vote for whatever. But then I'm just thinking it's not even in terms of electoral politics because that is firmly in a, like a capitalist like lens. It, but, you know, for me, I know what has to happen, but it's not going to happen. And there's going to be some semblance of humanity forever, of course. I don't think it's going to be like, you know, complete extinction. But I think there's going to be a point where it doesn't matter anymore because, and I think we're seeing that right now because if we can all watch what's happening now and I'd say most of the world, if we're going to poll it, would say it's bad, right? No matter what their allegiance is, you can see what's happening and, and say it's bad. And we're just watching the UN where five countries control what happens. So once one of the security council members doesn't you know, approve of this or the main people don't approve of this, sanctions don't work, nothing works. So Israel and the US are rogue states, but because they're you know, two of the most powerful countries in the world, what can we do about it? And like, what's the point? And that's why I'm at in this space. But then there's two paths you could go on. And you let me know how you think about this as someone, because we talk about your volunteering. You can either go from the space of, the world is terrible. It, all this terrible stuff is just a certainty. So I'm going to become completely selfish mm -hmm. and play this game. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become a terrible person because like, fuck you. It's bad. I'm going to do whatever I want to make myself happy, mm. which you can do that. And plenty of people do that. And that is actually the mindset of a lot of rich people. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, who cares? Like every, the world's messy, like whatever. But then you take the other path of, 
you know, I'm one of the privileged people who feels like they know about this and you want to spread awareness of this. And also, which is weird because the last video you were with, um, we're talking about this, living your values, and we can talk about this with you, is important if you care about this stuff. Yeah. So to me, despite what is happening, and I know like we're at that protest and I'm thinking it's great to be in solidarity with people, but this means nothing. Like this does not change anything and it won't change anything. And I know that, but it still feels good to go. Right. And like be there with other people and realize you're not alone. Yeah. And that's the com it's, it's basically comforting. And that's what is comforting about so many people speaking up and you have that comfort together, despite the fact you know you're so outmatched of all this stuff. And thanks to, you know, advances in technology with neoliberalism, we're so individualized as a culture. Collective action in a lot of these places is basically impossible in in, in the developed world, I'm talking about. Like third world to historic third world developing countries there's maybe a bit more hope for that because these societies are still forming but you know the uk is what like a thousand years old same people rule over us all our prime ministers go to the same school like i think it's like 70 percent go to Eton or something like it's insane yeah. but that's what the uk is and there's just like i think there's no hope for anything changing in this country yeah and if our options are rishi sinak or little less like horrible rishi sinak which is keith then yeah. what, that's the next 10 years of politics done, yeah. really? The thing that really bothers me specifically about Rishi Sunak is he is so rich and he's from yeah. such Nearly a rich a family man. that he is never going to see the world through a lens that's even remotely close to what everyone yeah. else in the country sees it as. So that's like, most politicians as Like, well. there is a video of Rishi Sunak talking at some event in um, an affluent borough where he's saying, we're going to, you know, ch channel money um, into, like, the, the rich areas of London yeah. and not, like, the poor... I think what it's did just, he it, say? It's just, like, I, he was basically bragging about taking money from poor areas and giving it to He literally said, we're areas. not going to give the money. And he's, he, like, it's like he said the quiet part out loud. Yeah. There's a video of him saying it, and, it, and he's kind of, like, like, laughing as he says it. And it's like, that... Like, that just says it all. Like, he thinks that that's something to brag about. Like, but, he says yeah. it out loud. But also, you know, he sees the world and, like, our politics through the lens of all these business decisions, all these financial decisions. He's a hedge Not, fund manager. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Not, oh, there's pe there's nurses who have to go use food banks. There's people that, um you know, don't have jobs. There's people yeah. that can't pay their rent. That There's well, all the, these problems. Like, he doesn't He even, blames the individual for that. Yeah, he's yeah, yeah. Liberal. He doesn't... Like he, it's having a prime minister that can't even fathom the idea of like not being able to buy your weekly shop because yeah. you don't have the money. It's like how is someone like that ever going to have our best interests hmm. at, at heart? Whereas Jeremy Corbyn, man of the people, like understands like the real world, like lives in like a no like a normal house and everything. But he also comes from a middle class background, but he just has the empathy, yeah, to actually care about marginalized people. Like you don't yeah. have to come. Like a lot of Marxists aren't from working class backgrounds historically, and so like you don't have to, and you can be a you can be born rich and still be a good person. Right. But it's like this brainwashing of Rishi Sunak. He just sees everything for you're not as rich as me because you're not as smart as me. Yeah. Because neoliberals are entitled to all, everything. They yeah. he he feels like he's earned everything. Yeah. And that's how he, that's how I don't think people realize how much the rich like. I don't think people actually understand the rich ideology enough in terms of. They're not like me. They don't even operate on the same level in terms of their brain. Yeah, they're that's what I'm saying. They're what I was like yeah. insane. Yeah, and and you only have to read about like Mark Zuckerberg or Silicon Valley, how much they love Ayn Rand and stuff. Like yeah, these yeah, people yeah. are insane, and I don't think pe enough people realize they will destroy the planet for profit. Yeah, and they won't feel bad about it. Yeah, because well, they they believe that's what you know the world is there for. Even like I, I worked for like a US. PR startup for a little while. Yeah. And it was fine in the sense that I wasn't like doing terrible things like every yeah. single day. For the mob. Yeah. <laughs> However, the people who were like starting businesses and stuff that I had to like deal with, it, it was just like, you, like even just the difference between being like American and British, I was just yeah. like, you are just, they're just so like, oh, like everything's about like being a go getter and like more money, like money, 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 money. Like, and it's like, you you know you're allowed to live in a world where you your ultimate ambition isn't money like the whole thing about Rishi Sunak wanting to scrap certain degrees like humanities and stuff yeah. and, it's, and it's like some people just want to live like a normal life and not yeah. like strive every second and of the day and every mm. day they wake up like 
how am I going to get the money today? It's like, I just want to have enough money to like live a normal life. Like we always say, like we like very simple activities. Yeah. We like going to, like for a walk in the park and getting a coffee. Yeah, you're not going to find us in Dubai. Yeah, like, yeah. Chill on the beach Even if something. we suddenly had the money to buy like a Ferrari or something, yeah. I'm never going to do that. I don't, there's no part of me that wants a fancy yeah. car. There's no part of me that wants like a mansion. So it's like that, like I'm saying that from, I can say that because I don't have that money and I could fantasize about that if that's yeah. something I wanted. But that that is the perspective of like so many people and like, um, yeah, you know, it's the cult of neoliberalism basically and yeah, consumer so, capitalism. Yeah, so it was just like d- dealing with like lots of people who have this mindset of like, oh, here's how we like turn over profit, blah, blah, blah. Like, it like just how, do you, how do you monetize? And that's what the problem with the world is. How do you monetize everything? Yeah. And like monetizing even stuff like my passions, with, which I do with my channel, is hard enough. Like it's just exhausting. Thing about how how do I nickel and dime everyone? And I remember even like having like minor disputes with managers about like the rates and stuff we were charging. I was just like, yeah. this is astronomical for the the amount of work that we're doing. And I just feel like yeah. these are people, like the some of these clients are like just you know nor- normal people who have like a bit of extra budget for like pr yeah. or whatever and it's like we're charging them like insane rates for yeah you know like a, a an amount of work that i feel like i could be doing times like three or four but that's just and i think that's it's hard being a freelance journalist as well where you have to sometimes set your own rates so it's like yeah. you have to start like overvaluing yourself because it's like well oh i don't want to charge too much too much and everything but yeah, yeah. it's just it's crazy like i i can't think like that um that's probably why <laughs> it's like been stuck on the same salary for like years but yeah well yeah. That's, that's the thing because the society doesn't reward people who are happy well you can't be happy with your like relative income because everything's so expensive and it's just there's no help for anyone anymore and it's just like we're only to tie it back to everything about being bad um just everything that seems worse mm. and you know, working harder for stuff our parents had easier or just, like, everything was cheaper when they were younger, welfare state was better. Um, but, yeah, tying it, I just, you know, we talked a lot about the hopelessness. And I guess the American perspective in terms of materialism and consumer capitalism is probably very far on one side of the spectrum. But to kind of, like, round this off, because I was talking about how uh, I'm pretty, like, doom appealed about the future... And something that's made me feel better but worse is I've accepted the future. And I think that also comes from me becoming an atheist early on and accepting, you know, mortality a lot, you know, really thinking about mortality. Um, So I think these things come a bit easier to me, especially as someone who loves history and can think about the whole picture. Um, So, yeah, I'm not someone who particularly likes interacting with loads of people, but... um, I'm more doom appealed. So if you want to talk about this a little bit and how you feel about everything, especially the future. Um, so, and this will be like the last bit, but you talk about, talk about the charity stuff, talk about the recent charity stuff, like the financial issues mm. and talk about how that makes you feel. And one thing I'll say before is when I used to go football training, play at this community center. It's very nice. There's like a Nepalese community there. And they would like have their dinner, and then sometimes I'd go play matches. They'd be playing cricket, yeah. and it's very nice to see. Um, and it was obviously funded by the local council. Yeah. You see kids playing basketball, kids doing MMA outside, yeah. women's football, really nice. And what's been happening in the UK is so much of that has been cut. All this stuff, and which fundamentally helps people with community, but also stay out of trouble for young people with yeah. lack of opportunities and stuff. So on that note, that's depressing. Yeah. Uh, but let's talk about you know you've done charity work. So talk about that and talk about how that makes you feel doing something that on like a very individual level in terms of helping like a set of individuals, how that makes you feel and how it makes you feel that there doesn't seem to be loads of funding for stuff like this when people really need like these services. Yeah, well, like growing up, I did like after school clubs every single day of the week. And I was thinking about this recently. I've always been felt very strongly that it was like a really core part of like what formed my identity. And I've always said this, like, I have never, I'm really, really fortunate that I've never had mental health issues that haven't been, like, circumstantial. So I've never had, like, a... Like, chronic or something. Yeah, like, I've never had, like, an imbalance in my brain, just, like, inexplicably or whatever. And I've always felt that, like, I just, like, I'd come home from school and I'd be, like, drama club, swimming, Irish dancing, uh, netball, like, same at uni. Like, I did everything and like my my parents have always said like I'm an all-rounder because like I've just I did everything and 
at university. Same I remember, with me when yeah, I was a kid as well. I remember people being like, "Oh my god, like you need to, you need to chill, you need to calm down a little bit." But I just, I just couldn't stop. Like it's literally the thing that has given my life purpose, and it's always made me so happy. And I'm just like, I've always felt really strongly that just having something to go and do or somewhere to go has been so important. Um, which is why it's been so like devastating to see like community centres and stuff get closed down in London and it's like you look at like kids who get into the wrong crowd or yeah. like crime and stuff and, and so it's many like this... men in this country footballers say the only thing that saved them from a life of crime and that sort of environment was playing football and signing yeah. pro contracts and stuff and it happens in America with the NFL as well yeah um yeah so yeah it's just been really sad to see like funding and stuff like get um yeah get lost for that and, and but how does it make you feel like, cause I'm talking about, I don't have much hope for the future. And while it's nice to see all these people doing stuff, I don't really think it makes a difference. So how does it feel to actually just like kind of push all that away? Because you don't know, you know, people work in charities, you assume are left leaning, but you don't know anything about really the, the moral yeah. views of these people you work well, with. So talk about how that makes you feel. And like, just generally, does it make you feel better about the world? And yeah. Stuff? So um, the point I was getting at was when we lived in Asia for seven months last year, it was like the first time in my life where... I had no extra responsibilities. Like, like we worked and stuff and obviously we like traveled to an extent, but it was kind of like the first time we'd like lived a normal life away from home with like, couldn't see friends or anything. So it gave me like a lot of clarity about like what I want to do and what's important to me. And I, I was like, I've done charity work before. I've done things with school. I've done like visiting old people's homes and various things like that. But I was like, I want to commit some of my time to like doing charity work because um in the context of feeling like hopeless about the world and stuff i just thought well i'm not gonna be um leading revolutions or like starting these huge movements but as someone who felt a lot of benefit growing up from like small scale um initiatives or whatever yeah. in the community like that was really helpful to me so i was like i want to be able to do that for people so um yeah like in the summer i started volunteering for a charity that um helps people with like various different like issues they might have faced whether it's like domestic abuse um mental health issues health issues loneliness like loads of stuff and it basically operates within my borough and um it's like a it's just like a little group where we meet up and we chat talk about music and various things and um then I got a call from one of the like volunteer supervisors this week basically saying that the council who fund the groups, not the charity, but the groups within the borough has like withdrawn the funding. So I said it was just so gutting because this was an example of like, I can make a difference in a small, in a small way. I can make a difference to like th three to five people's yeah. week because I'm giving them this space to come and talk. And, and I was saying like, even for me, it's been so beneficial because I've started giving my... It's like I've been doing a four-day work week. I'd dedicate my Fridays to this and then I'd work on a Friday evening like I did today instead of during the day. Yeah. Um, so, like, yeah, like, just being able to, like, finish the work week and be like, now I get to go and do this nice thing where I just switch off for an hour and I can, like, chat and everything. So, and that's me who doesn't have, like, a reason to be there necessarily. So then, like, yeah, had to, like, break the news today. And it was, like, honestly devastating to see people's reactions. Like, it really, um, I was really taken aback. I, was, I didn't yeah. feel prepared. They were to, like, closing down a lot of stuff, not just Yeah, today. it wasn't just that group. It yeah. was all the groups. And we had, and some other company might be taking over or something. But I just, that was hard because I was like, okay, so this is something I did to try and feel like I can make a difference in a small way. And it, and it's like the financial thing. It's like, yeah. oh, now there's no money for these really vulnerable people who really need this. So it's like, yeah. what is there left for people who need help? But I know that like the people who I do the volunteering with, um, we, we don't know like their individual issues, but they're obviously vulnerable, lonely, whatever it might be. And it's like, oh, well now, uh, the council can't even put money towards this. So what are they putting money towards? Yeah. Um, and so many going bankrupt for stupid things. Yeah, it, and it's well. kind of like, okay, so like the the small joys that I was trying to be a part of for people, we can't even do that anymore. Yeah. And it's just, yeah, it's kind of like, well, what what is what is there left? Like tr um, truly it feels like there's nothing good left in this country that's the anymore. Problem.
neoliberalism is that not only is everything put on the individual, it separates everyone. And like going to different countries is interesting. Like Thailand, they're talking about homelessness. And someone, yeah. someone asked the guy, he's like, why is there no homeless people? Like, really? Yeah. And he was like, oh, because in Thailand, you have responsibility to your family. And <laughs> if you don't have a family, you just go to the Buddhist temple. But it was an interesting thing in terms of like, we, and I'm not saying Thailand doesn't have homeless people in poverty, but I'm saying it's an interesting cultural thing that, they have and you see it because you know you're from a south asian background as well and we know like a lot of south asian communities and stuff or people in communities the family dynamic is a lot stronger where yeah. like we sadly in this western society have brought more into kick everyone out once they turn 18 or 22 or whatever and it's kind of like if you don't have that social safety net of a community which you don't in neoliberalism a lot of the time because we're meant to just be you know everyone comes to london from somewhere else you're all separated, don't talk to one another. Um, and if you don't have that with your family as well, then like, what do you have? Yeah. And then if you don't have the government stepping in, what do people have when they have nothing? Yeah. And then they're even more vulnerable to doing stuff like you said, you know, sadly, um, what happened with your boss and st- or your ex-boss. And that's why it's just like, you know, capitalism is a death cult and that's why I'm very hopeless about the future. And it's just, I think, it sounds weird to say, I think a lot of the hope for the future died with, the end of the cold war just because neoliberal capitalism became absolutely dominant and i said this in a video the other day uh francis fukuyama's end of history is obviously wrong but i i don't think necessarily the vibe of it is wrong in that capitalism has taken over absolutely everywhere and everyone is becoming like us like ne- like these countries we spoke about are not immune to neoliberalism like i spoke about some someone who's in japan talking about the you know the difference is there but it's still a lot of the shared problems And then when you realise it's just this one thing, like an ideology and an economic system that creates all this misery around the world, like how can the human race provide enough food to feed everyone but millions die of starvation? Like how is that even a thing? Yeah. And it's like, and you remember you used to have that like make poverty history stuff. And it's like there was no economic analysis to poverty exists because of the economic system makes it exist. You have to actually get rid of the economic system to end poverty. You can't just end poverty because in this system there has to be poverty for it to like exist in the way it does. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, like it's just, um, the thing is if people like worried about us, I would say don't be (laughs) like generally, I wouldn't say I have, I've been having it bad lately, but I'm generally like a pretty good person for mental health. Thanks obviously doing this full time, but it's just my outlook on the future is very bleak. Um, And the only thing I'll say like this video isn't to make you feel better, but it's to make you realize that, if, if you feel alone feeling like this, and I know some people often do when they grow up in very conservative communities and capitalist communities, you feel like no one feels like you. And a lot yeah. of people said that yesterday. They're like, I, I felt, when I, was in, when I was working in the 80s, I felt crazy because yeah. I felt I was the only one who felt like this. And they're like, I'm happy the young people don't we feel like this. We both felt like that day one. Yeah, of our, of our <laughs> and I, I spoke about that yesterday. Yeah. So yeah, I would just say... Um, and I, I can speak to this as well. Do you want to talk about the environment before we get round up on a positive or...? Uh, there is no positive for me to run up on. Um, I can say something. Okay. Um, and my last point is just, yeah, like, it's just sad because being left wing, people think it's like, you know, people think you're, you're, you're dumb or you're too emotional. And it's like, no, you're educated. You know what the, solu- you know what the problem is. You know what the solution is. And that's why you'll never see power because you're just never, you just can't seize it. And then I feel like with the future of humanity progressing, there is no hope. Like, there's never going to be like a Fidel Castro again. That just doesn't happen. A Che Guevara and Fidel Castro, that just doesn't happen anymore. You can't, they can't exist because of the humanity's advanced to a certain way, surveillance states, globalized capitalism. Where, how do you even do this anymore? Like how, how do you fundamentally change things anymore? And in a place like the UK, it just, it just doesn't happen. And it's just one, one thing to note on my um, Republican revolutionary ancestor um, he got very uh, disillusioned with the electoral system because he used to do elections for like two Republican parties in Ireland um, when it was part of the British Empire. And uh, he was literally one of the original members of uh, the Easter Rising. He planned the Easter Rising and he was like the most militant member, even though he couldn't fight because he had polio. And he was convinced of militancy from a, from an early age. I was saying to my mum the other day and I was like, I can't believe, just thinking about him in a pub in Belfast, thinking about that and then starting something that overthrows the British Empire is just insane to me. And something like that just doesn't happen anymore. Because it can't. Because like I said, with the Mr. Robot thing, 
it's like a mathematical certainty that this power structure just consumes all. And like in this instance, people of Gaza are the sacrifice. And like, I'm sad to say, like, unless it goes extremely wrong for the Israeli army, I don't see anything stopping them. Like they're not going to stop. And that's why you hope that something does go wrong for them because you don't want this to happen. But at the same time, in terms of the international community, they've accepted it as a reality. Yeah. And they're not, they're not, you know, China, Vietnam, all these countries are not going to break off diplomatic relations with Israel, despite yeah. even being Marxist countries. And, and then stuff. it's also like, how many decades in the future is it going to take before everyone looks back and does what they do with every It'll genocide? It'll be five years and they'll be pretending they never yeah. spotted it. I mean, Keir Starmer's already trying to walk back on yeah. comments that there's literally video footage of. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about the environment at all? Or No, you, you go ahead. You, you can finish your, uh, the thing you were thinking of. Yeah. I'm, I'm done with my point, I think. Okay, yeah. The only thing we haven't spoken about is the environment, but I feel like that is... Everything that has needed to be said about that has been said. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm vegetarian. You don't eat a lot of meat anymore. You do what you can on like an individual level to yeah. feel better about it it's obviously i mean it's it's hard to be like um to feel consistently motivated about the environment stuff when there's like things happening like palestine immediately right in front of your face or ukraine yeah or COVID exactly or, yeah whereas yeah. you're also being told like the world is literally ending um for the environmental reasons but that's kind of like an ongoing thing but um yeah, that's obviously always depressing but it's kind of like on a different level but yeah just i i think i am naturally an optimist and um i was saying today like we went for like a nice local walk and the colors of the the leaves were really nice and it was really bringing me a lot of joy because we yeah. didn't have autumn here last year we were in asia and i, I was just like loving the, the red and the brown leaves and we had a coffee and it was really nice and we were saying it's almost like you can just like transport yourself out of what's happening for a little while and i think it's just important to like allow yourself to have like small moments of joy and um I don't know if this is necessarily relevant for your audience, but like I was speaking to you the other day about how you'll see in a lot of like women's magazines recently, people talking about things like romanticizing your life, being the main character. Uh, people were talking about this thing called like glimmers where it's like um, appreciating like the small things. Um, there's this like influencer feminist called um, Florence Given and she calls it living deliciously. I do think like I, I've always naturally subscribed. I was saying I used to live like this before all of these words were like, um, you know, phrases in my mind and stuff. But like, I think it's just like appreciating the small things. And like, if you can walk out the front door and appreciate that it's like blue skies and a really crisp day, like that's the kind of stuff that, that makes me yeah. happy on a day to day basis. And I know it sounds a bit cheesy, but like that is truly how I try to like not <laughs> lose hope <laughs> on that note actually there is a subreddit called collapse support because yeah. there's a subreddit called the collapse i don't recommend because it's all about the world ending but there's a subreddit called collapse support which might have similar things about what you just said there about how to cope with it but the thing is someone said to me yesterday i like i firmly believe so much of the mental health problems are caused by capitalism and i was like it's true like we can say all this stuff about distractions and you have to distract yourself. I do that. I binge video games. That's how I distract myself. Like tomorrow night, I'm just going to play like eight hours of video games. I'll probably do it on Sunday as well mm -hmm. to make myself feel better. But then yeah. it's like, even that you, sometimes you catch yourself when you're doing it. You're like, Oh fuck. Like I'm so privileged right now. Like yeah. I'm literally just doing this to distract myself. So yeah. Anyway, um, to wrap it up. Yeah. Like I wasn't trying to make anyone feel better. So don't put in the comments that I made you feel worse. I'm just trying to vent. And I just hope some people said yesterday it was nice for me to vent about something. So I just hope if you feel like you're alone in terms of feeling terrible about the world, like I think so many of us feel this way. But the reason I'm not optimistic about our generation, like young millennials like us or uh, Gen Z, is that I made a video recently about Gen Z Congress people in America who are like 25 and they all support Israel. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like that was before we started yeah. as well by the way well it's it, the thing is with gen z is like and they're democrats as well yeah someone gave me this analogy once and i think it's like really accurate is that um the what's the generation before millennial x yeah gen x were the the, the generation that had a certain type of view and like things were the way they were. Millennials are the ones where you have been part of the transition and yeah. you have like understood uh, these new views like ha like evolving in real time. And Gen Z is like, this is the way it is. 
And I almost feel like, I don't know, sometimes I feel like Gen Z needs to be braver in like having their own opinion as well. Cause it's like stuff like TikTok. I watched a good video the other day as a podcast where they were talking about like, um, the girl boss of the girl bossification of um describing like conflicts and stuff you might have seen that it's like oh here's yeah. the explainer yeah it's like okay no, girly no, pops no. here's israel palestine in like one minute yeah. and um there's a really good journalist from navarra media um i saw a little snippet they're arguing about yeah it, moya yeah. she was talking about how the the, the mass education from tiktok or whatever it is is a good thing but don't let your education stop there. Don't let your mm. whole opinion on something so complicated be formed on something by like a one minute video. Yeah. Like go go and like have the courage to have your own opinions on yeah. stuff. You can tell as well. Like I was arguing with people who were like 18 year old leftists yesterday and they're having a go at me because I said Israeli is not an ethnicity. And I'm, they're like, yeah, it's an ethnicity. Or like 70% of uh, Jewish Israelis are born in Israel. That's an ethnicity. And I'm like, that's not an F- I don't know if you don't know what you're talking about basically and it's clear like I wouldn't know their timeline it's clear that they're like woke enough but my their, their problem with me is that I said yeah majority of Israelis are complicit in the system because they support it and they serve in it and they were mad at me because they thought oh you're being like maybe even anti-semitic because I'm saying Israelis yeah and I'm like well it's clear you actually haven't read about the topic you might have just like you say got this gen zification of here is the conflict Israel, Palestine, Israelis equals Jew. Yeah. Or like Israeli, like Jew is a singular like thing in Israel as well. Like it's all one group of people. So yeah, like I I, I, I agree with that more and more, but it's better more people know about this stuff. Mm. But at the same time, complex, learning about the complexities is good. But the thing I'll end on is you don't have to learn because you just know it's wrong. Like, And I, I've been saying this for years in terms of Israel, Palestine. That, any, um... anyone, who, anyone who just like makes you shut up because I say it's complicated um, is either someone who supports Israel wants you to shut up and scares you or someone who just doesn't want to take a side because they don't know enough and they're insecure but it's pretty clear you just you know, go on Twitter for five seconds and you know who the bad guys are yeah that Palestinian poet writer journalist Mohammed El Kurd he yeah. did a news interview he's obviously like absolutely amazing talking to news presenters and sort of like um, flipping the like playbook questions like on their head and stuff yeah. but he was asked like how is the how is the Muslim and how's the Arab community feeling about this right now? And I think he said something like, "It's not just them; it's anyone who has a conscience that is f- like feeling yeah. and should be feeling a certain type of way about this." Um, I can't remember what point you made that made me think this, but oh yeah, you were just saying about like um, complexity, maybe. Yeah, yeah, like it's, it's like even that. And and, Arab and he, mean, he said yeah. in another podcast, I think someone said to him like. What, what's the thing you would tell people if, if you could tell them about like what's going on and he said just how absurd it is it's not even oh it's so ancient it's so complex it's like no like people are knocking on people's doors and like taking their property yeah. from underneath them and it, um, it's as simple as but that even that like um last point for me is just there's palestinian christians who had their church bombed right yeah and that's not that's the complexity you have to learn is that when you learn about conflicts like this it, israel see palestinians as the enemy it's not even a religious thing yeah. palestinian christians are some of the oldest christians um that church from the oldest churches in christianity so day, yeah. and they attacked it yeah so it's not a war against like islam or this sort of islamic fundamentalism and you know this the israelis are very cozy with the saudis who love this sort of stuff anyway um so it's just like it's a war against and that's the complexity thing is like yeah there's palestinian christians um, there's Arab Jews, like it's it, it's yeah. not like such 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 a binary thing, but that doesn't really matter because it's all about bad actions by one government are worse than the bad actions of like a militant group, and everyone can see that if you're not completely brainwashed. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the one. If I have one optimistic point, it's most people do not buy the propaganda, and I've been on this issue for literally my whole YouTube career. I've been talking about this, um, and. Yeah, like, um, I didn't feel isolated because other leftists have always spoke about this, but sometimes you felt like you were talking into just, a, like, a tiny echo chamber of there's only a certain group of people who care about this who are, like, your age and are leftists. Yeah. And now it feels like everyone cares. Yeah, like, I remember, um, I would definitely say over the last few years, like, my understanding of a lot of this stuff has, like, improved. Like, one, because I've, like, tried to um, improve my knowledge on it, but also just being someone who operates within a a capitalist system, everything just kind of clicks, it just kind of falls into place, you just understand it better. But I remember a few years ago, 
like literally just watching those explainer videos on YouTube and being like, right, I need to understand this. Yeah. And even if I didn't necessarily have an opinion on it yet, I was like, I need to understand it. And that was before TikTok had even like blown up and everything. It yeah. was it was like there's there's so many resources out there. So I feel like if you do have a, a conscience and you even if you acknowledge that you don't understand it, if I saw what was going on, I'd, I'd be like, right. I need to go understand it, especially if I was a celebrity. I'd be like, this is unacceptable yeah. that I have the platform I have and I do not know what was going on I mean, right now. Obviously, everyone who does a history degree in politics degree know this, but if you are just very interested in like the representation of that part of the world, Edward Said is Palestinian, obviously been dead for decades, but uh, reading his stuff at university is just very interesting and it still resonates. So I'd say to everyone, because it's relevant, Palestinian guy right there, wrote a lot of good political theory about how Westerners view Middle East, obviously Orient, as we used to describe it. So yeah, go read that and maybe just get some people you know to read it. It's, it's Orientalism is a very easy book to read and it very succinctly links historic European colonialism to Israeli colonialism. So I'd say everyone go read that. Uh, and yeah, I'd say the main thing is listen to marginalised groups about their own history more because you'll learn a lot of things that you don't know and also you'll get the perspective of, you know, people who have either suffered or have family. Like, if you speak to anyone in Ireland, they will blame the famine on the British. If you speak to anyone in Britain, how the Irish famine happened, they will say it was natural causes about potato famine. Yeah. And that's because you don't have the perspective of the people who are actually like, victimised by this. Yeah. So that's why it's always important, like... If you're reading this history, but also, yeah, you have to check who you're reading sometimes. You don't want to get some weird nationalist or something. But yeah, that's it for the video. Um, very long one today, uh, just to round off the week. And yeah, let me know how you guys are feeling in the comments. And yeah, no doomer shaming here, please. I know people get upset sometimes and it's like, I'm not going to vote for Joe Biden or I'm, I'm not going to vote for Labour. But on the comments of this video, I don't really want to hear any of that stuff. So uh, yeah, that's it. Um, thank you to Holly for joining me again. This is your third video maybe second video I don't know. second one in the, in the last couple months yeah. and yeah i'll see you next week for probably more coverage of this you know terrible situation this terrible world